All right, hi everybody. So let's get going. Uh, so project 2C, the auto grader, the extra grader auto grader is due tomorrow at 11.59. If you want your 12 points, just submit by that time tomorrow night. Uh, sorry about the glitchy and the auto, glitchiness of the auto grader this morning. I don't know if you ever go to sleep late at night thinking, okay, we got it, it's good to go. Then you go to sleep, but it's not dead. So anyway, apologies to those of you who found that flummoxing, but you're good to go. Uh, any questions about project 2C stuff? Yeah. It's good now. Should be good. Yeah. And I reran all the submissions. So if you had weird results earlier, you're good. Should be. Cool. Other thoughts or questions? Okay. Hopefully it's uh, inspiring and cool to be able to build this thing. I'm not intimidated. All right. So we're going to talk about sorting some more today. And we are going to reflect on the question we ended last Wednesday on, which was, how do we deal with the worst case pop possibility for quicksort. So just as a reminder, quicksort is all about partitioning. If it had a name that was more accurate, it would be partition sort, uh, but it's called quicksort. And so if I partition on 32, it ends up in this position, uh, and then we have the smaller items on the left and the bigger items on the right. So as we discussed, the runtime is theta n squared in the worst case, which is pretty bad. And last time I had the question to you, which is, well, what do we do to avoid worst case behavior? So we mentioned that the average case is n log n, but there are real world inputs that are n squared that will cause you great grief if you try and sort, for example, an array in sorted order, which you might do. Like you have an array, you don't know if it's sorted. You run quick sort, and then, oh, it went n squared, and then you have to wait a long time. That's very, very bad. And so you guys came up with a number of suggestions, which I will not re-enumerate. Instead, I'll just talk about the general philosophies out there in the real world. And you guys had great suggestions last time. So there's basically four ways you might try and fix the problem. One is randomness. In this approach, you pick a random pivot each time. So instead of using the leftmost item, you just pick anything. Or you can shuffle the entire array before you sort. And in both of those cases, you will, get, you will avoid the worst case. The chance that you will just accidentally happen to shuffle things into an order where it's n squared is basically zero. You should be more worried about like quantum teleporting through your door or your bed or whatever at night. It's just not going to happen. The next is try and do something smarter with pivot selection. Someone suggested if we want the pivot to end up in the middle, we should use the median. Pick the median, it'll end up directly in the middle. So if you could calculate or just approximate the median, that could work well. Third approach, which nobody mentioned, but it's kind of cute, is you have quicksort that is watching its own recursion depth, and it says, if I'm more than, I don't know, uh, let's say five log n levels deep, something weird's happening, so then I'll just switch to another sort. Uh, and then a fourth approach is, let's pre-process the array, and we can look and see, is this a good array for quicksort, and if not, use something else. Though I will note that there's not really a great way to do this. So these first three uh, do actually happen, especially uh, this top one, and to some degree the second one. These last two are, are a little quirky. Okay. So that's philosophically. Yeah. So the randomness may pick the wrong point. So you have a whole array. You pick something random. Could it be the smallest item? Yeah. So then what happens? It gets put at the front, and then you have all the items left to consider. Okay, so that's not so good. But it would be very surprising if you just happened to pick the smallest again, and again, and again. It'd be the equivalent, like, say you have a one million-sided die, and you roll a one. You're like, oh, wow. And then you have now a 999,999-sided die. You roll again, you get a one. Like, you would, something weird's happening. So the randomness actually works in practice. Yeah. You could do pseudo-random, or you could do true-random. We haven't distinguished these in class. But, yeah, either approach would be fine. Yeah, so the argument was, if pseudo-randomness, uh, one danger with pseudo-randomness is, what if someone poisons our random number generator in such a way that it causes our quicksort to break? It is, in theory, maybe something that could possibly happen. It's kind of an interesting challenge, though I think it would be pretty difficult to happen in practice. Yeah. All right. Uh, so I like, of those philosophies, randomness the most. Like, to me, that feels good. Um, now, certainly, uh, in the last two weeks, you have felt the my one character flaw, which is that I really like changing things and just, you know, like, hoping that it works out for the best. But sometimes it causes grief. Sorry, autograder aficionados. Uh, and so I'm a little, like, I'm, I was a messy person when I was your age. 
much cleaner these days, but man, I was, it was like a dishes in the sink kind of guy. I apologize. I know I'm a monster. So as a result, randomness is kind of my, my thing. Uh, and, and the basic idea here is that if the pivot always lands somewhere good, right? Quick sorts in, log in. Um, and, uh, but the bad side, of course, is that we can have these cases where if it's already in sorted order, or if all the items are duplicates, or it's in reverse order, those n squared things do happen. Okay? So to deal with them, as I said, we can pick randomly. Uh, or a second approach in this way is we could shuffle before we sort. Both of those are basically the same idea. If you think about them, I mean, it's not obvious, but they have a similar character. It's just not very likely that you're going to end up in these worst cases where everything is already in sorted order. Okay? Now, one quick note, and this is a little beyond the scope of the class, but uh, if it's not in the study guide problems, hopefully I should add one, uh, which is that if you use the shuffling before you sort approach, then it is still possible to run into n squared behavior. Um, it, it depends on the partitioning scheme you use. So some of the partitioning schemes that you guys came up with, if you use it on an array where all the elements are six, it'll be n squared. So you have to be careful about that. And there's a classic uh, textbook, algorithms textbook, that's famous for messing this up. All right. That's nice. All right. Now, here is this guy. Uh, the reason I bring him into play is that I think it's fun that the fastest sort is also the strangest. So this is a guy from the show uh, Renegade, which is a show I've never seen. Has anybody here seen Renegade? I never saw it. Uh, but yeah, so Renegade, show from the 80s, uh, and it's about a guy who, as you might imagine, uh, is framed for a murder he didn't commit, uh, and then he goes traveling the world on a motorcycle solving problems. Okay, So I like that that of all of the possible heroes of sorting, that, that quick sort, like, merge sort's kind of bureaucratic. You know, cut the array in half, you cut it in half, da 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 And it's fast, it's in login, but it's not as fast as quick sort, which, you know, just rides around with his long flowing hair, devil may care attitude, leaving autograder bugs in his wake, you know. <laughs> so there you go. So I just, I like it. I like that the fastest sort, in general, is random. It's just cool. All right. Now there's another approach, which is let's be smarter about pivots. So it turns out that uh, you might say, let's not use the front element. That's dangerous. Why don't we use, like, the eighth element? Or maybe we'll use, like, in the middle but two over or something. Well, it turns out that, or actually another approach someone suggested is, why don't we pick three values and then use the median of those? So I take the last value, the first value, and the middle value. I compute the median of those and use that. Uh, but it turns out that any pivot selection procedure that is both deterministic, so no randomness, and takes constant time, that is, it only looks at a constant number of the array elements, that there exists an input that will cause that quick sort to go in squared. Now, this is, again, a really pretty advanced but cool topic. If you want, you can read about it in this like fairly readable paper, uh, which is called A Killer Adversary for Quick Sort. And it's basically you create an object type that knows it's being quick sorted, and it decides its values later at a later date. And it specifically, ultimately, what it does is it generates a value that will cause quick sort to go in squared. Now, uh, one note on this is that Java's quick sort is, in fact, non-random. So Java's quick sort, there's an array of integers that you can give to it that will cause it to crash because the recursion depth goes too deep. So in the case of the systems engineering here, they've decided that it's just not worth uh, their, like, doing randomness. Anybody want to speculate? Why, why doesn't Java just use randomness if they're leaving themselves open to an array that will crash if it's just sorted in a certain order? Yeah. Oh, so randomness leaves open the possibility. So I actually don't think it's that. And that seems like a very natural decision or natural conclusion. But the thing is, the chance of it happening is literally so low that you should never worry about it. Yeah. Yeah, getting random numbers can be expensive. That's the, or it's just, you can generate them somehow, but where are you going to get them? And I think that's ultimately what it comes down to. It seems weird that an important sorting algorithm should need to pluck randomness out of the air. So from a systems building perspective, it's just gross. You have to get the randomness from somewhere, and there's nothing that feels quite right. And I think that's pretty much what it is. But yeah, I'm happy to take other thoughts. Yes, so from an API perspective, 
if you wanted to make behavior replicable in the case of bugs, your sorting algorithm would need to have something where you specify the seeding or something. So it makes using the sort, either you have to live with one of two things, unpredictable behavior or a sort of kludgy API where every sort needs to involve a pass of some kind of random source, which both seem bad. So that's kind of the approach. So they live with it, and it's, and it's fun. I like that this is it's the messy real world, and it is the case that Java, there are certain sequences that will give you, um, maybe I should post one online. It's kind of fun. You can download the sequence, put it in an array, sort it, and Java will crash. Just a sequence of numbers. Text file. It's neat. All right. That's what they decided to do. Okay. Another approach. Um, so we're not going to do the actual timing experiments in lecture, uh, but another approach you might try and do is calculate the median in uh, linear time. That is, you take the entire array, you find its exact median, and then you um, use that as your pivot. So if I take if I take an array and I find its median, and then I quick and I partition on it, where will it end up? In the middle, which is where you want it to be. Now you can do this if you use this approach. Your quick sort is indeed safe. It's worst case n log n. But overall, it'll be slower than merge sort. And how do we know that? You run some computational experiments. Yeah. Got it. So the question was, could you use the tilde notation, which is an optional notation from our optional textbook, to compare quick sort and merge sort? If you know what it is, it's difficult to do because you have to count all the operations. If you just count only compares, it's not quite right. So there's this common question in 61D, which is, why is quick sort faster? And it's just, it kind of falls out of computational experiments. There's no real easy way to look at it and say, okay, this is the reason it's faster. So the answer is no, not really. All right. And then there's that third philosophy, which is you watch your recursion depth. If it becomes too big, you switch to merge sort. Uh, that's perfectly reasonable, but nobody seems to do it. I don't really know why exactly, uh, but I like the what we've landed on instead. Okay. You might say, why don't they do this in the Java quick sort? That would save them the problem of the programs crashing. I actually have no idea. Anybody have any thoughts? Like, why don't they just do this? Because it will crash. You can try it. It's too weird? I don't know. Maybe that if statement for checking the recursion is too costly. It costs something. Nothing's free. All right. Okay. So to summarize all of our sorts, we had four key ideas. And remember, the reason we're talking about sorting is it's a microcosm of how we solve problems in general. We had selection-based sorting, which is about finding the smallest item and putting it at the front. We had insertion sorting, which is taking the items one by one and inserting them in the appropriate place. Merging, which is about merging, and partitioning, which is about partitioning. So we can summarize all of their performances in time here, that heap sort is n log n, insertion sort is n squared, merge sort's n log n, and randomized quick sort is n log n, at least that's what you expect. But it could be worse with an infinitesimally tiny probability. Now there's some notes uh, that quick sort is, on average, it's about the fastest sort. And we'll talk a little bit more about fast versus stable soon. Uh, insertion sort have the neat property that if our array is almost sorted, then its runtime is theta n. Uh, if it, yeah, if the array has a linear number of inversions. And then there's this note here, which I haven't spoken about, which is that heap sort which is a perfectly wonderful sort uh, that is n log n in the, in the worst case. Uh, it's not really used in practice ever. It's pretty, it's beautiful, it's a neat idea, uh, but it has bad performance. And I'll just bring this up as a preview of 61C without a figure because I don't want it to feel like at all in scope for the class. But uh, basically, heap sort has an interesting property that it's jumping all over the place. So imagine that you're trying to sync an element in an array. You'll start at the root and then you'll jump really big distances in the array to find your children. So in 61C, you will learn the terrible fact that whenever you try and access an array element, a funny thing happens where a whole big chunk of data gets retrieved at the same time, and operations that involve using data that's close to each other will generally be faster. So heap sort, uh, that, that process of fetching chunks of data is known as caching. Uh, and so in 61C, you'll maybe, you know, you'll be in the middle of 61C, uh, thinking about all the projects you have to do, and you'll wake up one night and, and it's like panting, and you'll be like, heap sort, now I get it. It's slow because the caching performance would be bad. Okay, so that'll make more sense in the future. Uh, but just be aware, if you're curious, or if you've taken 61C, that's the reason the heap sort's slow. And I just bring it up as a way to, you know, make ourselves a little more uh, educated. Any questions about our summary of our sorts? 
Oh yeah, please. So with a name like quicksort, which is accurate, does industry use it all the time? Yes, when you don't need this other property. If you just want speed, it's what's used. So in Java, if you sort an array of numbers, it's quicksort. All right. Now, as I said, quicksort, it's the fastest, but that's only true if we make the right decisions about pivot selection, partitioning algorithm, how we deal with avoiding the worst case. Uh, and so, again, I'm not going to run the computational experiment in the middle of the lecture, but I will show my table result. Uh, and so if we speed test merge sort versus quick sort, where we have three scanning pointers, um, we'll see that quick sort is not as fast. Okay. Now, a reminder that the quick sort we had last time was we always use the leftmost uh, partition or pivot. Uh, the partitioning algorithm was we always make a copy of the array and then do three scans for the red, the white, and the blue items. And then we shuffle uh, before we start. So if you run this, but I found that the timing of the lecture just, I don't know, I want to leave more time for questions because this went a little long last year. Um, we had, you will find that merge sort that Java has built into it takes 2.1 seconds, uh, whereas quick sort using this, the reason it's called L3S is it's saying it's using leftmost pivot, three scans, looking for all the red items, the white item, and the blue items, and it shuffles. Uh, you'll find that to sort 10,000 integers 1,000 times, takes about twice as long. So quicksort doesn't do as well if you use this approach. So this is with this uh, version of partitioning and shuffling that I did. Okay. So just to give you an example of a more state-of-the-art and was one of the best partitioning schemes for a long time is this idea that Tony Hoare, the guy who invented this in the beginning, he proposed a scheme which involved two pointers walking towards each other where they do things in place. Okay, this is just a fun... Uh, alternate version of partitioning that I think is worth learning. Because this is, if you go to a job interview, I'd say this is probably one of the most common partitioning schemes that people might expect you to know. Uh, and certainly you should be able to come up with it if you were being you know, uh, asked questions. And so the basic approach is that there's a left pointer that likes small items and a right pointer that likes large items. And they're going to walk towards each other and they're going to swap things that they don't like. And the end result is that the things on the left will be small and the things on the right will be large. It'll make sense as we do a demo, okay? So here's L. The L pointer is a friend to small items, but it does not like large or equal items. Okay. And the G pointer, it's a friend to large items, and it does not like small or equal items, okay? And they're going to walk towards each other, stopping whenever they find something they don't like. So for example, L, okay? And actually, <laughs> something I kind of glossed over, all these decisions are made with respect to the pivot. Okay, here's our pivot, the leftmost item, 17. And so the L pointer is looking at 15. And what does it think of 15? Smaller. So does he like it? Yeah, likes it. Friend of small items. Hello, lovely 15. Okay, so let's move one step over and we get to 19. What does L think? No, don't like it. Okay, so L will stop and be good to go. All right, how about G? So what's she going to do? She's got the 17. It's her first day on the job, and she has to assess the 17. What does she think of G? There's 17. Don't like it. Don't like 17. So she says, I'm not even going to do anything. It's like at first, literally, you just got to the job. You just started working, but you immediately handle well uh, the 17 that's there, right when you start. So what they're going to do now is t toss the 19 and the 17 swap. Uh, and so at this point, they do like a, you know, jumping in the air, like anime cartoon thing, uh, toss them at each other, and then they flop. Okay, so that's all that happens. So we got 17 and 19. Okay. When I was a kid, I would occasionally watch Dragon Ball Z before school. And it was not a good show. Sorry if you like it. Because nothing happens, which you probably know. It's just like this excruciating repetition of like people powering up. So anyway, all right. So anyway, all right. Yeah. Oh, yeah, so why did the leftmost 17 have nothing done, have nothing done to it? Because it's the pivot, and I should have made that more clear, sorry. So when the game starts, basically L and G, they work for the 17. Like, it's the pivot. It's the decider about how everything works. So we're only going to process the items that are not the pivot. Does that make sense? Okay, all right. So let's go. All right, so they swap, uh, and they're going to keep moving along. 
Now, at this point, whenever they do the swap, they move because they shouldn't be looking at the items they're considering. Because remember, their whole job is to basically vouch for items behind them. Okay? So here, basically, L has said, OK, these are uh, valid items to be on the left side of the partition. Okay? All righty. So now L sees this 32. What does L think of 32? No good. OK, immediate trouble. Uh, and then on the other side, G, what's she going to do? Same deal, trouble here too. So they jump up in the air, they swap the 17 and the 32, and step towards each other. So you'll notice something is happening, which is that all of the items that are less than or equal to, sorry, all the items on the left side of the array are less than or equal to, and all the items on the right are greater than or equal to. Okay, so again, now L, does L like 2? Yeah, great. Okay, so 2 is cool, 26 is disgustingly large. Okay, G looks at 41. What does G think of 41? Fine. Okay, goes here, 26 is fine, and now they have crossed. Two is no good, and also, okay, hi, L, we've passed each other. So you can kind of see, even if you didn't understand every little step, once they've finished their respective jobs, they've thrown away all the detritus with respect to their own predilections about what makes for good people, uh, and so now they have uh, kind of partitioned the array. However, is this array partitioned around 17? No, why? This is our pivot. So why isn't this, what's not good? This is not the right place. So where should it go? In the middle, yeah. So if you had to pick it, like based on where G and L are, where should the pivot go? Where G is. And so it turns out that you could show a general, just do another example, and you'll see that it's clear, clearly true, that wherever G stops is where the pivot should go. So the last step is swapping the pivot with G. And so at this point, uh, we end up with, our uh, algorithm is done. So that's a way of partitioning. It's much more arcane than the partitioning scheme you came up with, but it works ultimately better because it's in place. Yeah. So why did I do these equal operations? So you can do this algorithm and cross out the word or equal, and what you'll show is that uh, on an array of all duplicates, that partitioning strategy yields an n-squared pivot, or uh, quick start. So this equal, stopping on equal is necessary in order to avoid the n squared worst case. This is not obvious, but it is a study guide problem. And that was the textbook mistake that I mentioned, that there was a textbook where they didn't do this, and then it was slightly embarrassing, and then they fixed it. Yeah. This partitioning scheme works whether or not you use leftmost pivot. So the partitioning scheme is independent of the choice of pivot. You would just, so the question is, let's say you pick a pivot that's not the leftmost item. What do you think you might do, just to, to speculate? So maybe the pivot that was chosen, if we go back to the beginning, maybe we pick two as the pivot. What do you think we might start by doing? Oh, you, mm, I'd actually, so you suggested starting the leftmost pointer like over here, but I think there's a better solution. Anybody see it? Yeah. Yeah, swap it. So you take the pivot you picked and swap it to the front. And then it just degenerates to that original case. And there's actually an important lesson in reductions and in computer science, which is that if you find yourself in a funny case, get yourself into a case you understand, and then it'll be OK. All right, someone had another question somewhere. I'm actually going to go to the end of the algorithm. OK, uh, oops, one more. All right. Other question? All right. And so now once you've done this, this is the old pivot. The array is now split into two halves, the left side and the right side. It is pure coincidence that the left side is sorted, uh, and the right side, you can see, is not. So we'd have two subproblems where the new pivot on the left would be 2, and the new pivot on the right would be 26. But I won't take the algorithm any further. All right. Okay. So moving on. This approach turns out that if you replace the quick sort partitioning that we did in the previous version, where we did the three scans, this will yield a very fast quick sort, one that is faster than merge sort. Though I should note there are faster quick sorts still, but this is a much better quick sort than what we saw before. Now, the overall runtime, even though we just strictly improved our partitioning strategy, uh, it still matters that we pick a good pivot. So it's, it's still possible, even with this strategy, to get n squared runtime. You need something to deal with n squared runtime. This is just making the partitioning faster. So if you rerun the computational experiment and uh, if, I don't know. Who would be interested actually? I don't want to do it right now, but who would want to do it later? I could put some code up, maybe. Yeah, I got a handout. I'll put it in the lecture code repo. 
So if you do this new approach, which is instead of three scanning, you do Tony Hoare style partitioning, uh, you will find that the overall runtime is 1.7 seconds. Now in this case, the pivot selection strategy is still leftmost, and the worst case avoided strategy is still shuffling. The only thing we've changed is the partitioning piece. Now, um, there are better partitioning schemes, as I mentioned. I don't want to talk about them because it would be pretty boring to talk even more about partitioning. Um, but uh, there are other schemes where you have, for example, two different pivots that are active at the same time. Uh, and actually, this, uh, interestingly, I'm not 100% certain this is now still the state of the art, uh, but the, the dual pivot quicksort that was used as the main quicksort for at least uh, you know, five or six years, maybe something better has come along, uh, was just posted on this random forum. So some forum where people are talking about uh, Java, specifically Java. And somebody, this guy said, hey, I'd like to share you with you this new dual pivot quicksort. I think you should replace Java's quicksort with this one. And then goes on and explains it, uh, does some computational experiments. And uh, then John Bentley, who's a very, very famous guy in the history of quicksort, he said, ah, I get it now. Now that I see it, it seems so straightforward and obvious. And uh, then he went on to say, I was very proud to make minor contributions to making quicksort better uh, after Tony Hoare invented it in the 60s. And made a, you know, he created this new, better version. And then he says, this random guy on the internet, Vladimir's contributions to quicksort go way beyond anything I've ever done. I feel so privileged to play a role in helping him with this. And now it's like the standard, I want to keep in mind, this is a Java class. So maybe it's not so strange that it's on a Java forum, but this is the best quicksort in all languages, as far as I know, uh, not just Java. So some guy just like, hey, I think you could improve Java by just fundamentally doing quicksort differently. So I don't know. So cool ideas come out of weird places. Post on the forums, I guess, is the answer, or the message. And nobody knew who this guy was. He was just some random guy. Okay. So when you guys come to office hours sometimes and ask me, hey, what if you did sorting like this? And then I'm like, I don't know, maybe it's better. You never know. You gotta try it out. It's possible. You could stumble on weird stuff out there. It is still the very early days of computer science, by the way. I mean, like, the field was just invented a generation ago, so there's probably all kinds of weird stuff out there nobody's found yet. All right. Great. So any questions about this? So we're going deep. I mean, maybe this is a little too much, but I hope you enjoyed it. Just that going all the way on one a little bit of the story. All right. So what if we don't want randomness? Uh, if you don't want randomness at all, as I mentioned, you could do smarter pivot selection. And so a uh, question for you then. Let's try and consider that approach where you want to use the median as your pivot. It's the best possible pivot is the median. You take that item, put it in the middle, run it, it goes and does something. So the obvious approach is uh, to do this. The best, the best way to get a really nice quick sort that would be even better than using leftmost is if I put the word median here, that seems like it should be good. So what I'd like you to do now is come up for me with, come up with for me. I don't know how to do prepositions anymore. I didn't sleep enough. So try and devise an algorithm uh, which computes a median of an array. And bonus points if you can come up with a way that it happens in linear time. And I'll give you guys, you know, 80 seconds. I've been talking a lot today. So give it a shot. Come up with a way to find the median of an array. All right, I'm gonna solicit some thoughts. So what do you think? Anybody got an algorithm for me? Yeah. 
Uh, double ended queue. Okay, hold on a sec. So let's try this. Okay. So create a double ended queue. I'm going to take all this stuff away. All right. Create a double ended queue. Okay, then what? Yeah, it's the next step. Yeah. <laughs> put it on the left side. If larger, uh, put it on the right side. Okay, now you run into a problem though. What do you mean by larger or smaller than the pivot? Ah, um, so in this case though, we have an array. We're trying to find the median, so we don't we don't have a pivot. This is just literally like we have an array. We want to find its its median. All right, take a snot over here. All right, next. Ah, use the quartile finder <laughs> from the past midterm. Okay, so what was that? You create, yeah, you create a min heap and a max heap and insert some yada yada. It's hard. Okay, that's a good one. So this this was an A A plus level uh, algorithm design problem. Um, try and devise it later, if you'd like. Okay, and log in. Okay, yeah, you could do that. Yeah. All right, nope, we gotta move on. Go ahead. Uh huh. Is this the algorithm from Tarjan or what? No. All right, har have an array. Of, so you have an array of five items. So this works for five. Any number. Okay, have an array of five items. Okay, great. Bring it to me. Okay, how do you know that it's the current median? Got it. Uh, let's see. Okay, keep going. Okay, sure. Uh huh. So the one to the left of the median is guaranteed to be uh, the next smallest. Is that right? And the one to the right is guaranteed to be the next largest. Okay, so this is like an inductive property that you're trying to maintain. Okay. So this is only true though if the numbers are like one through a thousand or whatever. Huh. How would the first item be the number of items though? So you're changing the actual number in the array? Okay. All right, I think this algorithm is too complicated for me to understand in the middle of lecture. But I'm curious to discuss it later. So I'll table it, because I'd be curious. OK, too complicated for lecture. All right. You could find the pseudo median by taking a subset of items. Yeah, but I want the actual median. Oh, yeah. All right, I want, I want an algorithm that is clearly correct that is not this one. So I, how about this? The building's on fire, and I need the median now. So what do you do? You need to write me a function. I mean, these are all interesting examples. Let's just say you wanted to code it up. So minimize the effort you need. Yeah. Oh, balanced. Uh, build a balanced binary search tree and take the root. This only works if the tree is perfectly balanced. So you might actually run into a little trouble. I want something even better. Yeah. Oh, nope, you're getting too complicated. Come on, guys. I need the median. It's so fast. Yeah. Partitioning. We can use partitioning soon, but not just one partition will help you. Next. An array list. This first one? Still don't think it's going to help you. Oh, guys, we're going to die. Come on. <laughs> I need it quick. Hurry. Yeah, sort and take the middle. Okay. So that'll work too. Okay. So if you ever ask the question, how do you find the median, that's the first answer. Then you can try and do better from there. All right. Now, why would this be a bad approach for finding a pivot? Because you're sorting. So it's a little silly to use sorting as a subroutine for sorting. So not so useful for quick sort, OK, as a subroutine. All right, good. This was fun. I enjoyed this a lot. This is one of those things where if we're in a 10-person class, we could really like dig into this and see what's going on. All righty. So we got a lot of answers. And so I'll note that actually. 
the question of whether or not it's possible to do an in time uh, was an open question in computer science for a little while. There's an algorithm called BFPRT you can read about. Uh, and uh, it was originally called PIC. So this was developed in 1972. I had a TA once who had a Turing Award uh, <laughs> when I was at Princeton, but he TA'd for me one semester for some reason. And uh, he was one of the authors of this paper. And uh, actually, if you look at the list of authors, these are really high-powered people. Four of them have a Turing Award. Uh, so that's pretty cool. So anyway, you can take this algorithm and code it up. And if you start reading it, it'll start sounding a little like your algorithm, which is why maybe I thought you'd seen this paper. Uh, but yeah, if you're curious how you find the median in linear time, this is a way to do it. Okay. So if you encode, you write up Bob Tarjan and, and everybody else's paper and use it for linear time median selection, it turns out that an exact median-based quicksort will take 10 seconds. That's pretty bad. So why just... It is guaranteed to be a better pivot selection strategy. It's always going to split the problems exactly in half. The recursion depth will be minimized, so why isn't it faster? Without even knowing why it works. Yeah. Because calculating the median is expensive. So even though every level of the tree is only doing in work, the aggregate total number of operations is too costly with pick. <coughs> All right. We went really deep into algorithm world today, so I hope you enjoyed it. Okay, I'm going to step back now, because this is about as deep as we're going to go with quicksort. Uh, so it seems like it would have been great, but it's just not going to work out too well for us to do this exact medium thing. Now, this does raise an interesting alternate usage for partitioning that I think is just really good to know about, again, because it's one of those things that people kind of expect you to know. So we can use partitioning. Someone started going down that route to find the median. And so the selection problem is a different problem than sorting. I'm just going to introduce it briefly and cover it. So computing the exact median would be really great for picking a pivot. It would give us a safe and very fast sort if we had a fast way to do it. But unfortunately, it turns out that the Tarjan uh, exact median computation is too slow. There are other versions where you try and estimate the median, but then they will be ultimately just not as good. Okay. Now, it turns out, by the way, that partitioning can be used to find the exact median. And so it turns out this algorithm we're going to see, this algorithm is the best known median finding algorithm. Uh, and, and what's kind of funny about it is that like the best way to find the ultimate median would be partitioning. And the reason that might be useful is you could use it then as the pivot for partitioning. So that's why I got the, the uh, Keanu here going, whoa. Uh, it's just it's a little like circular. It's a, a Roboros thing going on here. Okay. So let me show you what I mean. And we'll come back to this. So let's say we want to find the median of this array. We have nine, and after we partition it using whatever strategy, uh, we would end up in this position. Uh, in this case, the strategy I used was the three scan style, where six and five are here, and then we have 550, 14, 10, 330, 817, 930. Okay. So this is not the median. How do you know that nine is not the median? It only has two items left. Can't be the median. It's in place. So what do we do next? If we wanted to partition again, what do we need to do? Do we need to partition on both sides, or what do you think? Just the right side, because the median cannot possibly be on the left. Okay, so we only need to partition the right subproblem. So we're left with 550 as our new uh, pivot. Okay, so where does 550 end up? It ends up there. It's at position 6. That's not the median. How do we know? It's not the middle. That's at position 6. This is the middle right here, position 4. We count them. Four on the left, four on the right. So now what do we need to do? Do we need to look on both sides or only one? Only one side, the left side. So we can rule out those parts. We pick 14, it ends up in position four, we are done. Okay, so that's be we know that's the case because we just take the size of the array and divide by two. And then Java that rounds down, and we get four. So this is the fastest known median selection strategy. It's very simple, but we'll see that it has sort of a funny runtime. Yeah. It also works for even items. Uh, it will just pick one of the two valid mediums. Yeah. Uh, this, or, oh, geez. Hold on. 5, 6, 9, 10, 14. It's the median, right? So there's four values that are smaller than it and four that are bigger. So it's by definition, it is the median of these nine numbers. Makes sense. So it's not sorted, you're right, but we didn't care about it being sorted. We just wanted the median. All right, so we found the median. It's 14. Okay? So what's the worst case performance for quick select? 
this algorithm here, and give me an array that gives worst case performance. I'll give you guys a minute to think about this. So first think about what the, we think the worst case might be. Like what would it look like? So had the worst case is that the pivot doesn't move. All right. So what do you think the worst case is? N squared, I hear. Yeah. So it turns out that's correct. So the reason is, let's take, assume we have an array that's in sorted order. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, da, 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 up to N. We pivot around one, and it just stays in place. Then we look on the right, and then we pivot on two, and it stays in place. And now we have a problem of size n minus two, and so forth. And that's going to repeat over and over and over until you get halfway through the array. And so the sum of the numbers one plus two plus three up to n over two is n squared, theta n squared. Okay? So in the worst case, this pivot selection strategy is theta n squared. By contrast, on average, it will just be linear time. And this is just an intuitive picture, because again, I, doing a real proof involves calculus and probability. Uh, but intuitive picture would be, you start here, and it ends up in this position. Let's say on average it ends up, I don't know, somewhere vaguely in the middle. It's similar to our quick sort discussion. And at this point, do we need to look on the left and the right to find the median? No, we only need to look on the right, so we can ignore that part. It goes away. So now I pick a new pivot. It ends up, I don't know, there. So now which side do we need to look at? Left. Okay, so that part goes away. We repeat this process however many times it takes. This time we go left, and then maybe this time we're lucky and we find the median. Okay? So this is the, again, hand waving. I'm, I'm fully above board that this is not a proof. Uh, but on average, the pivot's going to end up, I don't know, somewhere around halfway ish. So it takes n compares to do the first partition then maybe n over 2, then maybe it's cut in half roughly again, n over 4, and so forth. And so ultimately, uh, the amount of work done in each level is decreasing. So it's n plus n over 2, plus n over 4, plus n over 8, yada, 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 down to 1. Need probability uh, to, to really show this, but the sum of those numbers, you may remember, is the sum of the first uh, so many, you know that should just be n. Yeah, so n plus n over 2 plus n over 4, yada, yada, stay to n. All right. Any questions about this? Okay. Now, what if we take the world's fastest... Oh, actually, so I should note, the world's best median-finding algorithm is also random and kind of wild and crazy. It has a worst case that's n squared, but as long as you shuffle the items before you start looking for the median, you're going to have good theta n. And if you do a computational experiment comparing Tarjan's pick algorithm to this, this does much better. Now, what if... You then use uh, quick select to find the exact median. So we replace pick with this partitioning based quick select. That's the name of it, by the way, quick select. Um, then that algorithm will be still quite slow. So I didn't run the experiment here. Uh, though I will note, it is very strange that a subroutine for finding the pivot would be doing a bunch of partition operations. So there's like some intuition for why it would be slow. Uh, but yeah, turns out it's just better to do a cheap partitioning strategy. Sorry, it's better to do a cheap pivot selection strategy than it is to do a better one that's costly. Okay, all right. That's our quick sort. You guys know more quick sort than anybody in the world now. Good. Okay, so we're going to wrap up today by talking about another property of sorts that's useful called stability, uh, and. This is because uh, it's the reason we don't just use quicksort all the time. Okay? So here we have all of our sorts, our old friends. Uh, and so the, the property that I'm going to introduce now is something called stability. So we say that a sort is stable if the order of equivalent uh, items is preserved. So what I mean by that is if I sort my students by name, here are my students sorted by name, uh, none of them cross over. Sorry. If I first sort all my students by name, you'll see here, these are in sorted order. Boss, all these. These are random names. That's why they're weird. Um, and here we sort by section. If we 
if we sort this list that is sorted by name, now by section, you will notice that within each section, everybody maintains alphabetical order. So we have Boss, Jana, Joni, Rosella. Okay, three, three, three. So the equivalent items don't cross over. This is in contrast to another universe you can imagine, where when you sort by section, you don't respect the pre-existing order. Okay, right? So it's possible, depending on, if you sort by name, then by section, both behaviors would technically be correct, but only the first would be stable. So here, boss is no longer at the top of the items that start that have the section number three. So to see if this idea makes sense, uh, do you think quick sort is stable? <laughs> I heard someone just go, nope. <laughs> but do you have to answer for yourself? This one says insertion sort on the question, doesn't it? That's fine. Okay. Oh, oopsie. You know, thank you. <laughs> There's another question on the slide. It's been a long day. You can also think about the other question at the top of the slide. Do you think insertion sort is stable? I thought they were two separate slides. I apologize. So insertion sort. If it has items that are considered equal, do they ever cross each other? What do you think? So in insertion sort, you're traveling along. Would you ever push your way past somebody else? The answer is no, you never would. So it is stable. So for example, if we look at the letter E, here's E. When E is traveling, it hits the wall and it says, I'm not going to cross another E. That's not right. So equivalent items never cross each other. So this is the proof that insertion sort is stable. So if you were to sort by letter, you know that all the E's will stay in the same relative order. How about quick sort? Well, in that case, it's actually a trick question. It kind of depends on your partitioning strategy. So if you use three-away partitioning, then it can be stable. But if you use Tony Hoare partitioning, it might not be, because we swap equivalent items. Okay. Why do we care about stability? Well, imagine that you actually want to sort your sections by name and then by section. It'd be super annoying if it was impossible to ever get this. So depending on the sort you use, you will either get this behavior for two sorts in a row or this one. All right. So in terms of stability, you can show heat sort is unstable, in short, insertion sort is stable, merge sort is stable, and quick sort is not. You did two of these. The other two are out there for you. Okay. So just to mention a few other things we can do. Um, there's other things you can do that are useful. So we could switch to insertion sort. Maybe you want to make your sort even better. You can optimize them, for example, when your subproblem size is 15 or less, use insertion sort. Another is make an adaptive sort. And another, a student was asking me in office hours about an idea for doing this. So you have a, if you have an array that has existing order, then you can exploit it. Like insertion sort, if it's almost sorted, it's fast. There's a sort known as Tim sort, which is the sort in Python and Java, and this is Tim. Uh, and you can also exploit restrictions on the set of keys. So if you know that the number of keys is some constant number of keys, then you can sort faster using custom pivot strategies. So just throwing out there, there's a whole world of other tricks you might want to play. Uh, and for quick sort, as I mentioned, you could be introspective. All right. So I'm going to leave this puzzle for you to ponder, and we'll talk about it when we pick up on Wednesday, which is that in Java, arrays.sort uses merge sort if the array is of objects, and it uses quick sort if it's an array of primitives. So sort of integers is quick sort, and sort of objects is merge sort. And my question for you to think about is why the heck do they use one instead of the other in each case? All right, that's it. So Wednesday, we're going to wrap up sorting, and uh, I'll see you then.